We are officially in the second month of Cards HQ operating, and boy, have I learned a lot. It has been a classroom education in operating a card shop here over our first month plus. I've learned a ton. A lot of things have gone really well. Some things have gone not so good. There's been a lot of surprises along the way, things that went well that I wasn't even expecting, but also some challenges that I didn't foresee. So today, I am bringing in a veteran card shop operator, Joe Davis from Got Baseball Cards. You guys know him. He's been on the show a bunch of times. He's a big-time, respected card shop operator here in the business, here in the Atlanta area. And I'm going to talk to him about some of my experiences and get his advice and wisdom and perspective on the business of cards. Joe, welcome back to the Jeff Wilson Show. We just had you on talking about grading right. uh, and all the shakeups that have happened in the grading world recently. But today, I want to talk about card shop. Sure it, thing. That's an area, much like grading, where you have an unbelievable amount of experience. You yes. opened your own shop, was it 1992? 91. 91. Yeah. Okay, 91. And and has been you've been operating continuously right. ever since 1991. And that, and we've talked obviously before, and we've done some videos on this channel before about some of your stories and experiences and history of that. And it's just, it's really incredible to think about the twists and turns of the sports card hobby over the last 33 years yes. since you've been opening yes. up your card shop. Lots of changes. Yes, I mean, it sure. feels to me like there has been an unbelievable amount of change over the last three years. Yes. But- you know, you've been at this for 33 years. So, right. I mean, you've seen multiples of, of you know, what, what collectors out there have gone through over the last oh, couple right. of years. Yes. Yeah, absolutely wild. Well, I am, you know, a little bit over a month in. We're in month two of my journey as a card shop owner uh, here at Cards HQ in Atlanta. And just to kind of set the stage for the audience, your store got baseball cards. You're out in Snellville, Loganville. Right. Um, about how long did it take you to get here uh, this morning? It's, it's right at an hour. Right at an hour? Yeah. Okay. So about an hour. Uh, if you drive fast, maybe get there slightly quicker than that. Sure. Or if you hit heavy traffic, it might be slightly longer sure. than that. So we're spaced out a bit. We obviously are hitting a little bit different, you know, in the same region, but hitting a little bit different, you know, geographics. There are some people who will, you know, who, who come and visit both of oh, our yeah. shops. Yeah. You said that yesterday there was um, some folks in from New Jersey, right? Who, right, who traveled to both of us. Traveled to both shops. Yeah. And so that's great. And, you know, one thing that I, there's there's a, a handful of good card shops in the Atlanta region. Yes. We're all pretty spaced out from one another. All of them are pretty spaced out. And one thing that I'm kind of hopeful for is, is, is we get a little bit of tourism going absolutely where people come and see multiple shops yes. you know where they maybe they come in uh because they've heard of your shop or they've heard of cards hq and then they end up you know they end up visiting the other shop and maybe they hit one or, or two of the other card shops in the area while they're here as well yeah i don't outside of la i don't know another major city that has as many good quality stores as atlanta does yeah it's great to see and and i hope that the community here continues to build we've obviously got the culture collision show which is uh was a, a great show in january um, really good attendance, and they're now going to do that twice a year. I think the next one they're doing, I believe, is September. In September. Right. Yeah, right after the start of the football mm -hmm. season, which I think is really good timing because you're going to have a ton of you know football card frenzy. Yep. At that Who, show, whoever's trending at the time, whoever's yeah. trending at the time. Yep. Um, and so, uh, yeah, it's it's um, it, it's a it's a it's a building card market in Atlanta, and it's one where I'm really hoping all the stores you know can kind of work in concert to help grow the entire market. Um, but I want to talk about my experience first, you know, first month plus here at Cards HQ. Sure. Uh, some of the things that I've seen, some of the things that, you know, surprised, et cetera. So I'm going to start off the bat. This is uh, a little different direction than sports cards. We have seen about a little bit over a third of our sales have come from Pokemon wow. and trading card games. You don't really you don't do Pokemon, we, we right? We do, we do. You do, but Pokemon. not not nearly to the to the degree that y'all do here. Why? Do. Why? And and did have you? How long have you done Pokemon? It's funny. We we did it originally. Okay. 
Uh, and then we got out of it for years where we were solely focused on the sports card market. And then in the last year or so, we've added back. Pretty, we haven't we haven't been there in a while. Yeah, but we have a pretty good selection now. Not okay. not the size that that y'all have here, but we have a, a nice selection of Pokemon and Lorcana and stuff like that. Okay, now. I I did so. I did not know that you had expanded mm-hmm. into that. Yeah, it's been a little bit since I've been out to your shop. Yeah. Um, and because that was going to be one of my questions for you. Why did you make the decision not to get into trading card games? But it sounds like you've you you've now made the decision to kind of get back into trading card games and right. embrace it. Yeah. Have you seen? Uh, is that an area where you're expecting to see a lot of growth, or or what is kind of what's your thoughts about about the state of that right now? Yeah, I, I'm surprised. I, I knew Pokemon would be a huge. Um, piece of your puzzle here i didn't expect it for you to tell me you're doing a third of your mm-hmm. sales or in that that's that's huge um so yeah we have an area for for non-sports and tcg right as you come in our door but uh and we do expect that to grow we're, we're known for sports cards i mean yeah. our brand has got baseball cards you know we're that's where our brand but uh you know I look at the graded side of things and I literally had texted my team this morning. I said, we've got to let people know we handle grading for TCG Mm -hmm. because that is such a huge percentage of the graded market now. And so that's reflective of how that side of the industry has grown so much um, because, you know, PSA is grading hundreds of thousands of TCG yeah. cards on a regular basis. They're they're grading about as many TCG cards as all the different sports exactly. combined. Yeah, it's so, incredible. So that that that's a huge indicator of what's going on in that sector. I don't know. I'm actually curious about this, and you you may not have the answer either. I really need to go talk to my my Pokemon guys here in the store. I don't know where all those graded cards go because you don't nearly see even if you go to a. Um, a trading card game oriented show. Like if you go to Collecticon, that's a big mm-hmm. card show that right. happens all over the nation uh, monthly. And that's where you see a lot of trading card game dealers, for example. There are slabs there, but there's not nearly the same number or degree of slabs as what you would see at a sports card show. A sports card show is slab dominated. Every exactly. single table, every single table, right. slab, slab, slabs. Uh, a trading card game show Certain dealers have slabs. A lot of dealers don't have slabs. Some dealers just have raw cards. That's pretty common too. Um, and then some dealers don't have any of the above and they have, you know, merch. They have, you know, uh, shirts or character hats right, or other right. things, right? That's It's like a mix of all of that. Mm-hmm. So the actual dealers with slabs is, I don't know, maybe a third of the show, you know, maybe a quarter of the show, mm-hmm. booths that have like a bunch of slabs. So I just kind of wonder, like, where are all these slabs going uh, that, you know, get yeah. get graded I, every month at PSA? I think a lot of it's just going to PCs. I, yeah. I think, uh, yeah, because, I mean, I personally buy, you know, hundreds or thousands of cards per month to grade, and I'm not buying TCG, but obviously PSA and, and other grading companies are doing a huge volume in that. But you're right. You don't see nearly the same percentage of their slabs ending up in show, dealer showcases. So that leads me to believe a lot of that is PC. The people are just buying them, grading them to put up in their collection. Yeah, I guess so. I guess so. And they're not, and they're not playing with them. No. The gameplay crowd wants rock arts, right. you know, so that they can put them into their decks. Right. Yeah. So, and that's an interesting divide in the Pokemon market. You know, you've got the collector side that likes the slab cards. You got the, you got the gameplay side. And so you got both audiences in that, in that market in particular. Um, yeah. TCG has been a big part of the mix here. I expect it to be a big part of the mix. I think part of the difference between your store and our store is from a geographic location standpoint, we're in a a uh, high, high traffic strip mall where there is a video game, uh, you know, like a, it's called main event. Right. It's it's like a Dave and Buster's. It's a giant, you know, video game uh, arcade right next to us. And there's a super busy movie theater Correct, right. right there as well. So there's actually a, a quite a bit of foot traffic in our plaza and a lot of kids because they're going to the video game arcade. And right. so we, I anticipated trading card games to be a big part of our business because I thought that would be the walk-in traffic. Yeah, the spillover from other things as well. Yeah. yeah. Other attractional things that are bringing kids yes. through the center. Right? And I think that, and I think that's where that traffic's coming from. I think we're seeing, I think a lot of the walk-in traffic, the people who see the sign, the people who look in the window as they're walking towards the video game arcade are like, oh, what's this? Oh, Pokemon. And we intentionally put all the trading card games next to our front window. I've talked about that before. Right. 
because we we wanted that we knew that people would come for sports cards as a destination but we but with pokemon we wanted them to really see that we had it your store is more of a destination store Correct. right you're a standalone building you're outside of atlanta and so people people have to come for a purpose to go to your shop so i imagine if we were a destination store I imagine we would not nearly have the same amount of Pokemon sales right now as we do. Right. Because yeah, the adults are making the decisions who are doing the driving. <laughs> yeah. So so whereas the kids, if they're in the center, you know, they can spill over, come in and, and get those uh, Pokemon cards. So Yeah, yeah, but it's definitely been a big part of our mix and we, we want to push it. Um, you know, we're gonna do we're planning, you know, we obviously have a lot of square footage here and one thing we we have not started yet, but we want to start is uh, is TCG tournaments. We, one of our, the general manager of our Pokemon section is a um, certified Pokemon professor. Um, so he can, he, I guess, has the proper certifications to run tournaments right. and, and that kind of thing. And so we want to do Pokemon tournaments. We want to do Lorcana. We want to get into Lorcana tournaments as well in store over time. It's part of the plan um, and, and really kind of lean into that world. Um, and that by no means does that mean sports cards aren't going to continue to be our focus. Right, they, they are. Right. I mean, they're a majority of our revenue. I expect right. them to be a majority of our revenue. Yeah. But the trading card game space does add a nice extra revenue stream and a little bit of a different customer base too. Absolutely, definitely. You know, yeah. the, there's not there's not that much crossover. There's some crossover, but there's not that much crossover. You, people tend to either, you know, be big TCG collectors or they tend to be big sports card collectors. There's not a ton of people that are big at both. Correct. Yeah. 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 So that's been that's been an element of I'd, I'd say it's maybe a little bit of a surprise that it's been as much of, of the mix as as it has been. But at the same time, we were anticipating it being an important element to the store. We try to design the store with that in mind. So maybe a mild surprise. Yeah. A mild surprise. Yeah, that is there. a strong, very strong percentage. Yeah. Because you have a great sports card collection. And so that's that is a big percentage. But yeah, that's great. Shows you're uh, attracting a lot of the younger collectors in, in yeah. the store. Yeah. Yeah. We've been doing live selling and we've been doing breaking. Um, and I know our strategy and your strategy on selling online are a little different, right? You you do a lot of traditional eBay, mm -hmm. big source of revenue for you. You do your own, you, do, you have your own website. Right. We have not yet fully launched into either of those things. And, you know, uh, traditional eBay is probably not going to be that big a part of our mix. We do want to put a lot of emphasis on our own website and we're expanding our website that's still a work in progress uh at some point we're going to have a huge inventory on our website but um we're building up towards that but we've decided to go the direction of live selling which is a little different i know and you've done a little we bit have, with ebay yeah, live and ebay live yeah. and whatnot and so forth yeah so you've past. done you've done some of that yourself but from a revenue mix standpoint when it comes to selling outside of the store we're looking at the live selling aspect being a very high percentage of that out of the store revenue, whereas your more traditional eBay and website focused, I would Correct. say, right. is that right? Currently, anyway, yeah. yes. How uh, do you do? You see that changing? Is it a scenario where you feel like that's where your strength is? That's where you've got the followership. That's the business you build up over many years. So that's what you're going to continue to lean into, or do you feel like times are changing and and you're going to go? you know, more in the direction of live selling over time. Yeah. I mean, we're always open to adding other pillars to our business. Uh, yes. eBay, we have about 300,000 items on eBay at any given time. And, and we have a huge consignment business and they, you know, the, the consigners love to track and monitor what their cards are doing that we sell for them online. And so, and that is what we've done. You know, we've done that since 98. And so we'll continue to do that. Uh, but I agree with you that things are trending towards the live selling and we as a company need to add more layers, you know, to our mix. And so we certainly are open to that. We've just got to put the right people in place and, and dedicate the time to it. Yeah. Um, our grading business is such a huge percentage of what we do. You know, we have nine to 10 people dedicated to that on a given day, handling different parts of our grading submission business. So that takes up, you know, a lot of time from em employees. It's really fascinating fascinating how in the sports card world there are these different different niches different ways that a card shop can lean into different sources of revenue 
And in our, you know, we've in our first 30, in our first, you know, month plus here, our revenue mix is is considerably different than your revenue mix. You know, our revenue mix consists of, first of all, a lot, a lot more TCG than yours does. Second of all, the all the all the online stuff we've done has all been live selling. And so our revenue mix outside of our retail is all is all whatnot right now. And eventually we're gonna get into Fanatics Live and others. Um, and it, that's a combination of breaking and a combination of especially a lot of live selling of singles. That's what we've been doing on those platforms. Um, whereas we, whereas we're not doing any grading ourselves. In fact, you're helping us out with our customers who come into Cards HQ with grading submissions. Right. We're actually routing them through you, and you're servicing those grading submissions because you got such a big team to do it and so right. much experience in that area. Um, and we're not on eBay currently, and we're not, you know, our, our website is still in its infancy. We're probably going to grow in those areas, but I don't anticipate, like, I think our revenue mix will forever be different because your, your yeah. revenue mix is a lot of grading, a lot of eBay. Ours will probably not be those things, right? And our, and our revenue mix will probably be more TCG, more live selling, and your revenue mix will not be as strong probably in those areas. Right. It's interesting how two car shops can can just have different revenue mixes, but both can be very successful. Yes, yeah. I mean, it's it's a uh, there's so many opportunities in this industry, and uh, my son always he's always on the cutting edge of, Dad, you need to get into this. You need to you know you need to get to the live selling. You need to do this. And I was like, and and I want to do those things, and we plan to add more of those elements. But I said you can't compromise what you're already doing right. You know, you get you got to keep all those things going well and, and doing them to the best degree you can and not compromise those by, by adding something else too quickly. So we, we, we want to get into all those things, just like you'd love to be doing everything under the sun as well. And you have plenty of things going on here. And it's an incredibly impressive what you've started here, you know, with the, with the uh, breaker cabanas and, uh, and, you know, so many elements you've added to the store, which are just great. And I love them. Um, but, uh, for us to get to those next steps, we want to make sure we're doing everything right that we're currently doing and then add, take one step at a time. I mean, that's really important advice. Um, I totally agree. You can, you can easily, you can easily kill yourself by trying to do too much and, and by being all things to all people. Mm -hmm. Um, there's a, you know, a saying in the, in the startup world that, you know, if, you know, if you, if you have too many ideas, you have no good one, right? Because mm. you got, you know, you you you've it's it it comes down to executional ability, right? And there's there's a challenge that um, a lot of entrepreneurs have, and 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 I have it to a degree where you see so much opportunity in so many different areas, and you're like, I could do that and be successful. I could do that and be successful. I could do that and be successful, and I could do that and be successful. And that can actually be one of the more dangerous characteristics of an entrepreneur when you're starting a venture, because I have seen plenty of companies die, and I'm not just talking about the sports card space, I'm talking about all kinds of different industries. I've seen plenty of companies die because they have too much opportunity and pursuing too many opportunities. And the truth is they may all be good opportunities. They may all be successful. But if you try to go after all of it at once without really nailing a couple of things and doing that exceptionally well and making that profitable and making that scalable, then you're you're going to end up all that opportunity you have is going to end up killing you. You're going to end up being mediocre at a bunch of things, and then and being mediocre at a bunch of things is much much worse from a business perspective than being really really good in a few key areas. And it seems like you've kind of built your card shop around. I want to be really really good at certain things. Right. Yeah. We focus on you know if you look on our website, we say you know our mission is to honor God as we serve collectors, and that. And we focus our team service, service, service over selling, selling, selling. And so we've become known for that for, for collectors. Just as, as I was telling you off camera, we had a number of collectors travel from multiple states yesterday to come see us because they wanted help with their collection. They had shops 10 minutes from them and they drove five hours to come to see us because they, they wanted help with their collections from a team they trusted. And so we love having that reputation and we love having that focus. It helps us stay, stay geared for what we want to achieve, you know, which is helping collectors. Uh, and that's why we end up with a lot of large collections coming to us. 
Um, you know, we, we recently, um, they're handling over a thousand 1920s era strip cards of, of many hall of famers. that was brought to us. Uh, and we've handled a number of collections of like entire set runs from the forties on up. They come to us because they want the help that we can yeah. provide. And so, so that's, we're known for that, which we're proud of that. And so, um, we continue that whether it be a customer walking into our retail store, we want to serve them the best we can, whether it's a collector across the globe that needs help with grading, we want to serve them the best we can. So that's been, uh, that's always been a part of our strategy, but we focus on it more and more now. Yeah. And that's, uh, that's, that's, that's great that you've leaned into that and have built that reputation that way. Buying is a challenge for card shops yes. and we haven't, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll admit we haven't seen as many of those types of collections walk in the doors we would like to. You know, we've 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 had a steady flow of people coming in to sell their cards, but I've heard from you over the years, you know, many stories of these incredible, deep, extensive collections walking in the door. And we've had a few of those, but not not that many, not, you know, not the volume that we would like. And I, as you said, I think that's a uh that that takes time it takes time to build the reputation it takes time to build the trust right and that's something that can't really be short-circuited that's no. something that no. you you just have to be in the business doing things the right way yeah. for many years yeah. people find out about you um, others recommend you because you've built those relationships doing things honestly doing things as you said with the service of the customer at the front of your mind at all times right. And if you, you know, if you do that, if you put that, if you put that customer first and service that customer over time, that will yield really good dividends for your business. But it takes a lot of time it to does. build a reputation it, like it, that. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. You, you, you can't just open the door. I mean, you obviously already had, you were already well known by the, mm. from the day you opened the doors, which is why on opening day, you had a line of people out front. Yeah, right. I was here, you know, and so, um, but it takes time, um, being, you can be known as a, as a, uh, highly respected influencer, but it still takes time to be known as a highly respected shop owner. It does. It takes it, time. It does, 100%. And, you know, so from a from an audience standpoint, so obviously, you know, the, the real advantage we had going into opening up this shop, as you said, is the audience, right? We've got obviously a ton of people who watch you, us on YouTube, follow us on social and all that type of thing. That's why I have wanted to lean into live selling as heavily as I have because I believe live selling is the closest equivalent to the video content that we already do and are already known for. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. Selling on eBay is not what we're known for and not what we've done. Now, selling on eBay can be a great, obviously it's, it's worked extremely well for you. It's worked extremely well for many, many dealers mm -hmm. over the course of many, many years. But if, if we were to open up an eBay store tomorrow, what makes our eBay store different, better, more memorable, and how do I drive people there? I don't necessarily have the answers to those things. Right. Just because I've got a great YouTube show and a great video production team and a great social team, I don't know that those things are really gonna translate to my eBay store being super successful. Right. I do think those things are gonna translate to us doing one heck of a production on whatnot and our whatnot streams becoming very successful. Right. I think it's much more of a one-to-one. -one. It's a much more familiar territory for us because we can structure what we're doing with live selling in a manner that it has a it has you know that we're taking advantage of our of our resources, uh, you know, of right. our of our great production people exactly. to say how do we do this in a really cool way and make this entertaining and make this unique and make this look good and make this work really well and then build operations and processes around it and it for and and, and in my opinion it's easier to translate our audience over there like where you know we Quick, are quickly yeah quickly exactly and we've been able yeah. to do that like right. our, our whatnot streams are off to a really great start particularly live selling breaking's a little slower to evolve like we're we're, we're yeah breaking takes time to build that reputation yeah. as well breaking yeah. is slower we've not seen um we, we're doing both live selling and breaking um we're we've had success with breaking but our audience growth on the breaking side is slower the live selling has really taken off for us right off the bat and i think that that's the most you know similar to what we already do and, and have you know, done for years and have yeah, yeah. yeah. and so I, to me and that makes sense to me i think 
if we didn't have the YouTube audience, it, it would be a lot harder to get going on whatnot. It would be a lot harder to get going on whatnot. Right. And you know, one thing I've learned um, being on there now uh, is they, you know, whatnot, you, they, they, they have an algorithm in terms of like what shows you see when you go into the app for the first time, what shows are, are at the top of the listings, what shows are being promoted to you. They have an algorithm that essentially tries to promote shows based upon how long that seller has been with whatnot, how many hours that seller's live, what that seller's reputation is. I mean, it, it, of course, just like Google has an algorithm sure. where if you search for card shop in Google, who's Google showing you first? Well, it's trying to, it, it, you know, it, it too is looking at things like how long has this website existed? What's their reputation? How many listings does it have? How long, have people, how long do people stay on that website? Who's linking to that website? That's, those are things that can determine where you rank in Google. Mm -hmm. So whatnot has a very similar type of, for, of formula that you know shows where people are. So you have to, if you're going to be successful on a live selling platform like whatnot, and I'm sure all these live selling platforms are you know use similar, the same right. similar tactics, you have to do one of two things. You either have to be able to grind it out and wait it out because if you don't have the audience off the bat, it is going to take a lot of time for you to establish that audience. There will be many, many, many days where you probably are going to have like four people in your room, mm -hmm. um, you know, and um, I... I remember our early days on whatnot. Yeah. I remember, yeah, that's what it was like. Yeah, and so <laughs> you got to put in, you got to put in the time to wade through that and you got to be patient and you got to be committed to doing it for probably months and months before you actually start building up enough followers and reputation where your streams actually start becoming big enough where where it's really can turn into a, a bigger business for right. you. Um, or you can short circuit some of that by having a lot of audience and then being able to direct the audience directly to your stream. Right. We've had the good fortune of doing that. And that's why I, since I since I knew we could do that, since I knew we could get people from our YouTube show over to our whatnot, that's why I was bullish on the live selling, yeah. and that's why we said we're gonna we're gonna do live selling first, and then we're gonna do things like our website and eBay More traditional and stuff later. Yeah. You know, um, and and I think for us, live selling is our. That I still see that I'm, I'm more bullish on that. I'd say even than when we started, like even go back a month ago before when we were just kicking off live selling for the first time. Now that we're a month into it, I'm even more bullish on what we can do with live selling. Like I even feel like, yeah, this is like, there will become a point in time. We have six of these, you know, live selling cabanas on the edge of the store. And there will become a day when all six of these are filled and we are live in all six of them at the same time. I see that happening. It will take us a little while to grow into that. Multiple channels. Yeah. Um, so multiple channels on, on an app like whatnot. And then I think you're also live on a couple of the different apps as well. Right. Um, you know, and, and experimenting around with different apps. Yeah. And so I think, I think that's going to be our strong suit and our bread and butter. And I don't know how much we're ever really going to get into eBay traditional, right. Or, or some of the other, um, you know, sales channels. I, I'm not, I'm not sure. Cause it, as you said, it's, it's, a lot of it is about like, what are you best at and how do you lean into that? And how do you maximize that opportunity? Like you've done with grading, like you've done with eBay. And I think that's what we're going to really try to be focused on for us. I think it's retail and I think it's live selling, you know, and then, and then beyond that website and, and our website will be important as well. I think once that gets something going, but I think the reason why our website's going to be important is because we can once again, visually show the cards in video format and then link people to where that exists on the website. And so it's okay. still that linking from the content, the linking from the video that will help power that. Yeah, connecting all the dots. Connecting all the yeah, dots. Yeah. So that's kind of what our strategy is. And so you know, so far so good. We're in the early stages of all of this, but that seems to be working well for us. Yeah, I mean like back to eBay another point is like you can't we have like 140,000 feedback from mm -hmm. 26 years on there. That's not going to happen overnight. No. <laughs> and so and that's you know, your typical eBay buyer, that's one of the first things they look at. Like, oh, we just sold a 
53 mantle PSA 7 for 26,500, which was like 7,000 more than the last one had sold for on eBay. But our reputation helped get us that sale and, and the buyers trusted that they could mm-hmm. you know bid up to that number because they trusted us. And so, man, but again, that those things take time. You're correct though. The live selling for, for your team, it, there's certainly ways to short circuit it because you've already got the following, you've already got the audience. And so the, this, these discussions just show viewers that there's so many different paths in our industry to become a seller, you know, yeah. so many different platforms, whether it's the, the old school traditional selling on eBay or it's it's going on whatnot or eBay Live or whatever. So there's just so many. I tell people, they were told my team, you know, there are so many opportunities in this industry. We've just got to be wise and selective with which ones we pursue. Yeah, 100%. Um, let's see, what else have we seen? Um, base, we've seen? We've seen baseball and football be by far, yeah. by far, you know, kind of 1A and 1B. Mm-hmm. Um, basketball far behind right now in terms of what we're selling. In Which terms is a of huge singles. flip from just a few years ago. Are remember, you, is, you remember when basketball dominated yeah. just four or five years ago? Basketball yeah. was what we were all chasing. And and soccer, I've been a little bit disappointed in because I I I've I you know I thought soccer would actually be really good in our store because I know there is a soccer card collecting community in Atlanta. I know there's actually a lot of kids that are in our soccer cards. And obviously, we have Atlanta United, huge MLS team, probably the biggest fan following in all of Major League Soccer. And soccer hasn't... So what's interesting, actually, soccer boxes, we've done really well with. We've sold a ton of soccer wax. Of course, you got Messi in the new MLS products and everything like that, which helps. But we've sold a ton of soccer wax. We've been having trouble keeping soccer in stock. Soccer singles have done pretty poorly for us. Hmm. Which is interesting, you know. Baseball, we've been we've been great at both singles and wax. Sold a ton of both. Football, we've got an obliterated on singles. We can't keep them in stock. Hmm. Like football, we we just get literally like people come in and buy just swaths of our football singles. Football goes so fast. Football wax would go equally as fast. The problem we have with football wax is we don't have a direct account with Panini. We're having trouble getting it. So we don't have as much football wax as we need to keep up with customer demand. Well, I can tell you even having a direct mm-hmm. Panini account, the amount you get, or at least the amount we currently get, it goes so quickly. Yeah. Sometimes in a day or two, it's gone. So then we're still, we're on the secondary market yeah. trying to chase more because there is so much demand for football product. Right? And, and we'll see the same thing in 24 with the crop we've yeah. got coming out. Uh, yeah. Football is very, very strong right now. Yeah. For sure. So th- those are the things we've seen. And then basketball has been slower than I expected it to be. You know, we haven't, we've, we've moved some basketball singles, but not nearly as many as baseball and football. Um, we have um, moved some basketball wax, but we, we also don't have as much basketball wax because again, we don't right. have the Panini account, but not nearly as much basketball wax as football or, or, or baseball. We actually have slightly decreased. I, in fact, I just noticed when I walked in the card shop today that the, the guys just did it. Um, over the course of the last day, we slightly have decreased the number of basketball singles that we have in the store. And we replaced, we, we added, essentially added an aisle of older baseball and took an took a, a aisle away of basketball hmm. because of the sales mix, because we're just not doing as much basketball and we're doing more, we're doing more baseball. We've also though had trouble buying basketball. Um, that's the other interesting thing. We, we haven't seen, we haven't sold as much basketball, but we also haven't seen as much basketball come through our door either in terms of people selling it. So we also haven't had as many opportunities to buy basketball singles as the other sports. Yeah. Well, I mean, you look historically really since 1920 with Zion and Jaw when they were so hot, you haven't had a crop that right. was nearly as in demand as that was in season. Yeah. So you know, people, just, you know, collectors just aren't ripping the quantity of it. Therefore, they're not ending up with as many to grade. And I mean, Wimbanyama, I thought would mm-hmm. would reverse that trend. And I thought we would see a similar demand in for twenty three, twenty four product. And it's certainly the best we've seen since nineteen twenty. But it's nowhere close to those levels. Yeah. So, but I, I think 
it's just been kind of a, a lull the last few years. There hasn't been much excitement about any of the crops the last few years. So no one's broken massive quantities of product. So therefore, the singles aren't there to purchase. Yeah. And then meanwhile, in football, you've got all of these young quarterbacks coming in that people have been excited about. Yeah. I mean, this this year, uh, this upcoming draft in particular, um, you've got it. And of course, you had, you know, some draft class 2020, an exceptional quarterback draft class. At, you know, in mm. 2021, you had the five quarterbacks go in the first yeah. round. Now, not all of them have panned out, right. but nonetheless, there was a lot of excitement around and that. And Purdy has raised all the 22 products. Thank, yeah. thank goodness for Purdy in 2022. Right. We needed that. And yeah. then CJ Stroud in 2023. Right. So, I mean, you've actually had like you know star quarterbacks every single year now correct and you'll have it again in 24 so you'll have five years in a row of star quarterbacks that are really worth pursuing in those products right. and the quarterbacks drive everything else and the quarterbacks drive everything else yeah. yeah yeah and really i mean we've had a good run because in 17 you had mahomes in 18 you had josh allen and lamar jackson 19 kyler murray that one maybe hasn't been that's been maybe the one yeah and there was a while when kyler murray was as hot as all those other right. guys just not not recently right um, so, but there's really been quite a run for quite a long time on football yes, products. Yes. So, and remains to be seen, you know, what, what happens in the future when fanatics takes over and, uh, you know, how things will change and yeah. when, and how, how brands will change. I mean, you know, we already have collectors asking when, when, when is tops Chrome going to have football again? And, you know, oh, I can't of course they're that. already doing the, you know, the Bowman's the best Bowman. and the Bowman yep. and so forth. So fanatics is making what football they can and those products sell well also. Yeah. We've seen really good sales of the Bowman U stuff. Great yeah. sales. Um, that's been a strong product for us in the store Yeah, because the starting price points, at least for so far have been very reasonable. I love that. And you can get a couple of autographs and most, you know, so it's um, for the collector. It's a, it's a bargain. Yeah. They're collegiate uniforms, but it's a, it's a good price point. I feel I feel much better when a when when somebody comes in the store and they buy a box of Bowman U instead of buying a box of Prism because I, you know dollar for dollar. Yes, yeah. yeah. And I mean, look, I know you know they're not going to get the you know fifty thousand dollar one of one CJ Stroud out of Bowman U, but the you know they could buy a box of Bowman U for one hundred and thirty nine dollars, and I know that they're going to have a decent experience ripping it and getting some value back out yeah. of it, and not taking. They're going to get back. some base cards of of quarterbacks they know, and they're going to get a yeah. couple of autographs. And maybe it's, yeah, there's not a lot of downside. There's not a lot of downside in a product like Bowman U, whereas a product like Prism, when you're paying nine hundred dollars for a box or something like that, I mean, man, that there's, can be rough sometimes. Yeah. There, can, there people, can be huge upside or yeah. huge downside, either one. Yeah, there can be. There can be. It's much more of a swing. So uh, that's that's a nice product uh, for sure. Bowman is. Um, so yeah, uh, another thing that we've seen, maybe you you probably see this too. I wasn't expecting it when we did our sales forecasting for the store we spent time trying to figure out what we thought our sales might be every day of the week. Uh, we kind of went hour by hour. How many customers do we think we ha would have? What would be the average sale price? And then kind of what is that total up to? And then what is that total up to for the day? Um, we were actually, we actually made some pretty decent guesses when it came to like customer counts and average sale for most customers, we, we made some pretty decent guesses there. The one thing that we did not factor in or consider that has been a huge plus for us is the whales. We've had people walk in the store and buy, drop, you know, $4,000, $8,000, in a single visit mm -hmm. on high-end boxes and on high-end cards. Right. And gotta I mean, love them, right? Oh, you gotta love it. We had a guy. <laughs> we had a guy last week walk in here, and he spent over thirty thousand dollars in a single visit. He wow. bought most of the high end cards that we had, like a lot of the higher end cards that we had in our showcases. He bought like a he bought like a he bought our Wayne. Gret we had a Wayne Gretzky rookie that was um, eleven thousand dollars. It was a PSA eight Gretzky, or it might have been an eight five Gretzky rookie. Um, he bought you know, like a $6,000 card. And he just, he bought um, a lot of our higher end cards that we had in the showcases. We, and, 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 and we've, we have, we've had a number of these folks. And you know, what's interesting is like um, looking at our daily sales, I've been monitoring our, our kind of hour by hour sales and I'll look at it on like a Monday 
at like three, you know, three or four in the afternoon. And Mondays are our slowest, you know, Mondays and Tuesdays are our slowest right. days of the week. No surprise there. We were kind of expecting them to be. Um, but I'll look at our sales on a Monday at three or four in the afternoon and I'll be like, eh, you know, we sold, you know, we sold a few boxes here, a few boxes there, a few cards here, a few cards there, but a relatively slow sales day. Mm -hmm. And then I'll refresh the sales report at six o'clock and I'll be like, and our, 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 all of a sudden the sales were, were five times what they were at, at three or four o'clock. And I'll be like, what happened? How did this Monday turn into a really great, strong sales day for us? And I'll go up front, I'll be like, what happened? Do we have a rush? And they'll be like, no, it's one person. Mm. We had one person come in and buy a box of national treasures and and three boxes of prism and you know and and a couple of cards and walk you know eight thousand dollars you know whatever it was and, and uh -huh. eleven thousand dollars yeah, it can skew the whole day in it a can positive skew the entire right, day yeah. in a positive way right. it's been it's been a great thing it's just something that we never factored into our projections that and you don't see it every single day it's not like you know but it's but you get one of those people in the store and all of a sudden it like the whole the 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 day from a financial standpoint looks so much better. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm encouraged to hear that you're having those kind of singles sales mm -hmm. walk in because we just, uh, but I know you haven't been out the shop lately. We just expanded and added several hundred more square feet to our retail space. And we've ordered, uh, 17 new showcases, you know, based upon the ones y'all are using for the vertical. Oh, cool. And so oh, we're going to, we're going to be having uh, good, we have, we're going to be up to about 35 to 40 showcases by the time we okay. get done with the changes, which will allow us to show off several thousand more singles. Yeah. Um, because I, you know, time and again, I walk to my safe and I'm like, I've still got all these high dollar cards. We don't have room for them or yeah. you know, we don't have the, so, so we, uh, look forward to putting that type of stuff. Yeah. Out. It's done. It's done. It's done well for us. And I was nervous. We were nervous about it because those are the cards that when the market moves, you can get burned on more, right? Like it's, if, oh, yeah. if you know, if you've got a, if you've got a bunch of, of $70 cards in your showcases, the market movement's not going to create that much of a difference right. for you. But if you've got a if you've got seven thousand dollar cards in your showcases, you and know they get dust on them. Yeah, that's yeah, a they get a little dust on them. The market <laughs> movement can can be kind of painful, right. right? At times with those cards, so we intentionally didn't stack that many. Um, but the the ones that we did stock have all they they they've sold. So now we actually at this very moment in time, we don't have very many high end cards in our showcases that are you know. Two thousand dollars plus. Like we we have very few of those in the store at the moment because we've sold a lot of them, and so we need to get back out. We're going to uh, a bunch of car shows over the next few weeks. Um, I we've got plans to be at a, you know the, all the Dallas shows and you know a bunch of the a bunch of the bigger shows. Chantilly is coming up and those types of shows. And and we're planning we're planning on buying some higher end cards there. You know we're planning on buying some five thousand dollar cards and you know that kind of thing so that we have more of that once again for our showcases. Right. right. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. So we're a little more confident. We're a little more confident in, in the higher ends. We knew the low end would do well, um, but we're, we're becoming a little more confident in the higher ends. Um, but and I don't the market in general is just stronger right now. It is. I mean, I mean, from, I mean, the, the major shows, the reports I'm getting from the major shows is that, you know, a lot of people are moving a lot of those big yeah. cards again because last fall we were seeing that dip from the shows we were attending. But uh, I'm very encouraged. We're looking forward to the up. We're going to be in Dallas and Nashville and all the big upcoming shows, and we're looking forward both to buying and selling. Yeah, because it's uh, there's a really strong vibe in the industry again. Which yeah, is really good. I hope it continues. Last year, January and February were good. The year started off good. It started then to quiet down a little bit. And then it kind of came, you know, it kind of, uh, kind of roared up again, going into the summer, going into the national. Right. Um, so we might see a little bit of, you know, slow down seasonality naturally, but I don't know. The baseball season this year is certainly going to be interesting. And, you know, a lot of the free agent movement and Otani and Soto and, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of up and coming players that people are excited about that, that, that alone may help carry, um, you know, a lot of the card market through, through the spring. So, yeah. and fanatics, I have to give them, they've done a good job promoting new yes. releases. And so that gets their brand out there, gets the tops brand, you know, they get, they get, uh, you know, baseball out there in the public, uh, you know, yeah. uh, sports cards. So that's, uh, that's a win-win for all of us. Yeah. Yeah. Fascinating. All right. Well, hopefully 
yeah, I mean, hopefully that momentum continues. We're yeah. seeing it when we look at the data in market movers, when we look at the overall data trends, it has been a good month for this or a good couple of months for the sports card yes. hobby. Like the first the first couple months of the year were strong. We saw one particular data point uh, that we that we saw that I thought was um, a really good sign. We track we track the amount of um, traffic that we deliver to eBay through our own like price guide and um, our sports card investor app mm -hmm. and that type of thing. And um, our highest week in all of 2023 in terms of delivering traffic to eBay, the, the number one week out of all of 2023, we've hit that number three times, three wow. different weeks so far in 2024, we have delivered what we delivered during our peak week in 2023. Mm -hmm. So that's a that's a really good sign. Right. I mean, the, that sh the transaction volumes that we're tracking are all up from where they were a lot of last year. Yeah, well, grading um, submissions are up. Yeah. I mean, I mean both of the, the grading submissions we handle, and if you look at Jim Rate and see their reports, you know, volume is up, you know, PSA volume is up, SGC volume is up. And so that those are good signs that collectors are submitting their cards for grading. Yeah, so, I think the market's excited. in a healthy spot. Yes. I do. And it, it we were hoping that when we, uh, the, the decision to open up Cards HQ in January, um, we were, we were, or February 1st was our official opening date. Right. We, that was more just kind of by, obviously circumstance of when we got the lease done and when we thought, and then we pushed ourselves to be able to have that trade night during culture collision. That's an understatement Yeah, from your team. That's yeah. an understatement yeah. that you pushed yourselves. We yeah. really pushed ourselves <laughs> uh, and we got it done, but we also had in the back of our minds, that would be a really good time to open the shop because historically January, February, typically stronger months for the sports card market. And we, we whereas we did all of our buying for our, our initial inventory, October, November, December, when the market of last year, when the market was down a little bit, it started to kind of pick back up uh, towards the end of December. So that actually was really timing wise worked out really well for us because we we did a lot of buying in October, November. People were were selling their, their cards for less. There was con a little bit of concern about the market and also people just wanting, you know, funds for the holidays, right, the market was right. dipping, the yeah. market dipped in October, November, in the first part of December. We were buying a lot of cards then, and then thankfully, by the time we actually got around to opening our doors, the market was picking back up. And when we wanted to go price all the cards, there were actually a bunch of cards that we had bought in November um, where the comps had increased since the time we bought it. Yeah. So we were able that to get- great timing. It, was, yeah. it really worked out. So we were able to get the margin, not just the difference in spread between what we bought it for and then what it was worth. But now, you know, because a couple months had gone by, what it was worth was actually greater. So we were able to get a greater profit margin on those cards than we otherwise would have just because of how the market kind of picked up mm -hmm. from the time we bought it to when we opened it. Yeah, that's yeah. great. Doesn't always work that way. No, oh, absolutely If not. we had opened the shop in you know, October, November, we probably would have been discounting a lot of cards that we or had bought. At cost. Yeah, you know, yeah, or sell them at cost is probably what would have happened. So that would have been a much less favorable way to open the store. Yeah. Sometimes you get lucky. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, we got lucky in that case and the market right. timing just kind of worked in our favor. Uh, so, um, yeah, I, I'm very excited. I'm very bullish on the overall market right now. Like you said, all the trends we're seeing, you know, grading is strong. Um, the forecast for you know the things Fanatics is doing to bring people into the industry that's a positive. Um, you know we just came off of you know a huge trade night, um, the Rip night that that Tops and Fanatics promoted, and shops all over the country were filled with collectors. So that was just great to see. Yeah. And for us, we saw so many young collectors come in the shop. Yeah. And that's the other trend when you when you ask me a question about what I've seen in the hobby over 33 years of running a store, you know. For, for decades, it was basically collectors my age and older coming in, and now we see a huge percentage of young collectors again, and that's really only happened like in the last five years. It's a but good it's sign. Super encouraging. It's a really good sign, and, and I just love it. As a shop owner, it's so great to see fathers and sons, or mothers and whoever you know, you know, parents and kids coming in collecting together. It's just so exciting. I completely agree. Absolutely love it. Absolutely love it. 
All right, Joe. Well, we're going to wrap up. I want to tell the audience that uh, Joe Davis and Got Baseball Cards is the best way to submit your cards for grading. And if you have any cards you want to submit for grading to PSA or SGC, go to sportscardinvestor.com and click on grading in the main menu bar because that's all of the information about Joe's services, including pre-screening where they'll actually look at your cards, uh, tell you which ones they think are worth grading and also what company they recommend grading them with based on the type of card to maximize your return. So once again, go to sportscardinvestor.com, click grading in the main menu bar. Joe, thank you very much for joining us Thanks again for today. Me. Yeah. Really appreciate it. And of course, the full length episode of all of these Jeff Wilson shows. They're available on YouTube under the Jeff Wilson Show channel, as well as on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Make sure to subscribe everywhere, and we'll see you with our next one soon. Take care.